Shall we start, sir? Yes. Yeah. Good evening, all. Uh, on behalf of uh, College of Medical Physics, Physics of India, I welcome you all uh, for our monthly web lecture series. Uh, this month, uh, uh, we have a talk on overview of mega voltage X-ray dose com computation algorithms. So, I will request to uh, Dr. Paul. Please uh, moderate this session and uh, start this session. Thank you, Bach. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I'm sure people from various places have joined and uh, we welcome you all for this uh, monthly web meeting. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Jerry Batista. Actually, uh, he used to write his name as J Square Beta. Uh, that is the first thing that attracted me when I went to London some two decades ago. To give more introduction, I had an opportunity to work with Jerry uh, during 2001 and 2003 when I was a staff at London Regional Cancer Center. He, is, he was at the time professor and head of oncology of the University of Western Ontario. Currently, he is professor emeritus oncology and medical physics, University of Western Ontario in London, Canada. He is an excellent teacher. I used to attend all his discussion meetings with residents, even though I was a staff, because a great opportunity to learn from him. I remember his classes on radiobiology at the time. He used to go in depth and teach us radiobiology. And uh, not only a great academician, but he is also an excellent guitarist. Actually, he plays for uh, some big group in uh, Australia, sorry, Canada. And he may explain you that I don't know the names of them. Uh, with this introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Jerry Batista uh, to give his talk on overview of mega voltage X-ray dose computation and algorithms. Uh, please, those who have questions, please put it on the comment section. We will discuss those at the end of the lecture. Uh, Jerry, it's over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, being uh, here. Uh, with all of you um, across the across the world, and um, I would like to to start this uh, this uh, talk because there's quite a bit of material. So I would suggest you buckle your uh, your seat belts on this. Let me see what's going on here. Having trouble with the uh, laser pointer at the moment. Here we go. Uh, I would like to uh, dedicate this lecture to two uh, famous Canadian medical physicists, Dr. Jack Cunningham on the, on the left. He was one of my mentors. And in turn, I became a mentor for, for Michael Sharp, who was a graduate student in our group. So I would like to dedicate this lecture to them. Uh, our goal during this time is uh, for me to describe the essence, the essential elements of three algorithms, the Monte Carlo simulations, convolution uh, superposition principle, and the Boltzmann transport equation. And uh, as you know, I'm from Canada, so that's why we use this analogy. However, I do understand that uh, India is quite famous now in terms of field hockey with some recent uh, improvements in performance. We're gonna derive all these equations in the next 50 minutes. Uh, actually, no, that's not true. Actually, I, I believe, uh, as Dr. Shea does at the University of Waterloo. Yeah, okay. uh, and and uh, the, uh, the philosophy will be not to get into deep dives on the mathematics, but provide you with an intuitive kind of presentation that I hope will be comprehensible rather than comprehensive. I'll uh, cover the brief history of these algorithms and then move on to other topics. There were two giant leaps, I think, in the development of dose calculation algorithms. The first was Cunningham's splitting of the primary and, scatter and scattered doses. This was very important. And remarkably, in 1972, he developed a pencil beam model well ahead of the current pencil beam models. And these would allow for uh, passage through a, a beam compensator and, uh, and tissue as well. So this was well ahead of its time. 
The second major leap came in the 1970s with the development of the CT scanner with uh, uh, Alan Cormack here on the left and with um, Godfrey Hounsfield on the right. However, I do have to flag one of my previous graduate students, Rock Mackey, who uh, in the 1980s made some measurements in a cork water phantom and observed these very strange patterns. They had been seen before, but he drew more attention to them. Most of the algorithms of the time, ratio of TARs, even uh, equivalent tissue air ratio, BATHO method, they over predicted the dose substantially. Intuitively, they predicted an increase in dose as you might expect through a low density material. However, the observation was with measurement that the dose actually re was lower by about 4%. And these predicted up to 12% higher. That was a 16%, if you wish, error in dose calculation, totally unacceptable. So with the CT scanner, we were able to calibrate um, the electron density in tissue. This is the equation for the relative electron density, electrons per centimeter cubed relative to water. And this actually was produced by a, a student, Prasad, in 2005, and these are uh, in vivo measurements of tissue, not phantom measurements. So it's quite remarkable that this holds. And of course, as Canadians, we curve fit this to a hockey stick. And it's a beautiful fit. <clears throat> At the time, um, the calculation methods, the early ones, were limited in the integration. They only did one, uh, no integration, 1D integration, 2D integration. Some started to do 3D integration and they accounted for the primary scattered photons and eventually the recoil electrons, which is what made it possible to correct for electronic disequilibrium. So it at first was a multiplicative perturbation with an inhomogeneity correction factor and later become much more based on the principles of physics, atomic cross sections, mass energy conservation. Uh, this uh, graphic was produced by Michael Sharp, and you can see there's a big black hole in the middle here because at the time, the Monte Carlo method was totally impractical for clinical use. So the time was basically infinite, weeks for running a treatment plan. Things have changed, and now going from measurements in the 1960s in the water tank, and you're all familiar with that, and moving forward, correcting for tissue density, in the 1980s with the CT scans. And now we're uh, adding, of course, we have added charged particle scattering and looking ahead, perhaps uh, once in a while, taking care of atomic number effects and certainly adding radiobiological modeling and high LET machines are becoming cheaper. And hopefully one day we will have a very economic, we will have a very economical uh, carbon beam. That would be my dream. The uh, algorithms also have an expanding role. At the beginning, they were just used for interactive treatment planning, uh, but now they are used as well for dose reconstruction. If you have an EPID system, you can back project what the primary dose is or primary fluence, and from that calculate the dose distribution of the day. And then of course, if you use some warping algorithms, you, you can combine those results and do the accumulated dose of the delivered dose distribution rather than the distribution on a computer screen. So the goal of these algorithms is to compute a 3D dose distribution, sometimes a 4D dose distribution, and do that in minutes if possible. And all the algorithms really solve the same problem, but they have a different starting database, they have different assumptions, and they use different numerical techniques and they all compromise on accuracy and speed. Treatment planning, we think of as a computation of dose distribution, but I'd like to change your attitude on that and remind you really that the goal is to optimize the dose gradients. On the radiobiology side, we have the normal tissue curve that is unfortunately often on the left side of the tumor control probability curve. And our goal is to push the red dot as high as possible and the blue dot as low as possible. In other words, to accentuate the gradient. Now, what's the requirement for accuracy in the dose delivery? 
there have been a lot of studies on this. So first of all, I'd like to point out that a miscalibration of the hardware or the software will introduce an upfront systematic error that will continue throughout the entire treatment. So that's important to note. And then there will be random uncertainties that propagate as the procedures are put in place. There's also the possibility of a radiobiological amplification. If the slopes of the TCP and TCP curves are very uh, intense, then a small dose error of 3% does not mean that these will change by 3%. They will be accentuated. Finally, there's clinical response. And there's evidence that the patient and the radiation oncologist can detect changes of about 5 to 10%. They're observable. Finally, I would like to make a pitch that accuracy is very important for clinical trials. Whenever there's a multi-center trial, it is assumed by the oncologist that the dosimetry will be correct and consistent. That makes for a more efficient trial that completes with using a fewer number of patients, and it advances the field more quickly if we don't have to take into account the, the sloppiness of the dosimetry. This is an interesting plot on the left. It shows the loss of tumor control as the uncertainty goes up. These are standard deviations, 5%, 7.5%. And you can see that it doesn't take long to lose several percents of um, effect in tumor control or normal tissue uh, results. We, uh, in, that, in that case, we gain tissue complications depending on the slope of these curves. But you can see that it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is important to know that uh, Dose calculation is only one component of this, but we need to keep things tight. Here's an interesting plot of the calculated tumor control probability using a, what I call a primitive method, a pencil beam method. And you can see it over predicts the tumor expected uh, probability. However, the more modern algorithms end up predicting a value of, of more like 95% in this case with these algorithms. And that agrees quite well with the clinical situation. So if the algorithm is not correct, there could be a misleading of the radiation oncologist. So I, uh, I would make a plea that clinical software cannot be regarded as a black box. You have to open the box. And as a medical physicist, it is your duty to open the box and to clearly QA the software with upgrades in, uh, in software or new algorithm options of which there are many now. So miscalibration of hardware and software can be misleading. The IAEA did a detailed study of the dose accuracy requirements, and they concluded that it's bad or not recommended to put a number on it, not to say that we need accuracy to 2% or 1%, but rather to use the ARA principle, deliver the dose as accurately as is reasonably achievable. So algorithm progressions have taken place because the techniques have changed, and it's important to look for unforeseen limitations, the, the blind spots, the hidden flaws in the calculations. And computer technology has evolved with uh, GPUs and CPUs. So it's now possible to, uh, to do things that took weeks and do them in less than a minute. And so a lot of this came from the video game technology. And there's an example of a modern GPU. These are incredible, powerful machines. So let's look at the building blocks. Uh, all of you are, are medical physicists. Some of you are students. So I, I took the middle road here. I'll only introduce the key topics that are important to algorithms. So obviously, all these cross sections are important, all these interactions. And if you had to forget most of them, don't forget Compton scattering, because that's the most prevalent interaction for radiotherapy physics. And I also note that BABA scatter comes in when it comes to electrons and positrons. And uh, BABA was a very famous uh, physicist in India. The uh, interactions uh, begin at the machine head and proceed into the patient. These are wonderful plots created by George Haydock, a graduate student uh, with us and a, and a member of our staff and, and faculty. And uh, it's a plot in a strange space that you may not be familiar with. It's in the atomic number of the tissue and uh, energy of the beam, a photon monoenergetic energy. And you can see that in the head region, 
the pair production or triplet production is quite intense. The probability is high for high atomic number of materials like tungsten and for high energies like 10 MeV. But as we go into the patient, you can see this Compton, I call it the Compton volcano, where most of the interactions take place by Compton interactions. A few of them take place by photoelectric interactions. For example, when you do a KV CT scan and the pair production does come in a little bit for tissue such as bone, but it's not a very intense effect. So these are the interactions that you should have front and center when you think about interactions from the beginning to the end of the photon travel. The other important message I want to give is that voxels do not in interact independently. Uh, it's really a network of scattering pixels or voxels. Uh, scattering can take place from one of the scattering sites to another site and then onto the point of interest. Even in water, it's complicated. And these plots were done by uh, John Wong uh, a long time ago. And they show you how much energy is deposited here at P that was coming indirectly through a, a scattering site. And the importance of the first volume, DV1, is shown here in these ISO plots. The importance of the second scatterer, DV2, is shown in this plot. And the importance of a direct flight from DV1 is shown here. So these numbers are order of magnitude more than these first two, but it shows that nothing is negligible in scatter. There is a lot of scattering going on. And although the primary is dominant, usually about 80% of the dose, uh, the 20% from scatter cannot be ignored. So a three-dimensional problem of scatter requires a three-dimensional solution. And this has evolved over time. We all know about the water tank. That's a zero-dimensional integration. You get the whole dose pattern in one shot, although you do it one step at a time. And then here we have a pencil beam kernel. This is a two-dimensional integration. Here we have a slab kernel. And this reminds me of an old Cunningham program called C-beam. And finally, we have the slowest but uh, most accurate technique, which is a three-dimensional integration of the scatter from individual uh, voxels. The next important feature, and it's something I always tell students, and perhaps all of you who are working physicists know this very well, all X-ray energy is deposited by charged particles liberated in the absorber, period. Photons do not deposit those, only charged particles do. They, photons send their energy to the electrons and to scattered photons. This is called the terma, and that's used in the convolution method. And then um, there's also the kerma that comes from collisions along the red path. This is called the collision kerma, and there's the radiative kerma, uh, and there's also the scattered photon that combine into another quantity called the skerma. These are terms used by the Swedish medical physicists. So let's look at dose, its definition. Really, you can calculate the dose by becoming a customs officer. You can uh, look at all the particles that come in to a voxel, including electrons and photons, and look at all the particles coming out, take the difference, and you have the dose. There's this extra term here in case there are changes between mass and energy, and that's called Q. So here's a, you know, your typical, uh, I, I shouldn't say this, but a typical customs officer and asking you, uh, where are you going? Are you carrying any cash? That's the dose. What currencies do you have? Will you make any exchanges along the way? And that costs money if you do that, uh, or it costs money to convert currencies. And that's sort of the sum of the cues here. So if you do this and you do it for all incoming and outgoing people in a country, you can calculate the amount of energy that was, or dose, or a money that was deposited in the country. However, with the later uh, algorithms that we're going to talk about, the Boltzmann method, a different approach is used. An energy fluence is determined as a vector quantity. And then you can actually calculate the dose by doing an area or surface integral over a closed surface, and that gives you the dose. The negative sign here just means that the energy was lost by the fluence and it becomes dose inside the voxel. And you can also convert this uh, surface integral 
into a divergence uh, volume integral using the divergence theorem, similar to Gauss's law that you all remember from your electrostatics. I'd like to put in a plug for Pedro Andreo. Uh, a lot of the algorithms do not specify what material the dose is in. Saying that the dose is 100 centigrade is meaningless. You have to say it's 100 centigrade in water, in soft tissue, in bone, or in other materials. And uh, this is one point of confusion in many of the algorithms and a source of uh, conflict. Let's talk about disequilibrium. This, you will know, appears in buildup regions, beam edges, in homogeneous tissue, and in regions of electric and magnetic fields as we are looking at MRI Linux now. These areas I say are the risky parts of the dose calculation. You probably learned how equilibrium works in a buildup curve from Harold Johns in his famous book, The Physics of Radiology, another famous uh, Canadian medical physicist, but I should point out that actually Dr. Johns was born in China, not in Canada, although he lived most of his life in Canada. And the basic idea is that the electrons are set in motion, the blue ones, and then within the voxel, some other electrons are set in motion by photons, the green ones, and that um, this can build up to an equilibrium. And that's equivalent to taking the pieces of these tracks and putting them together in a fusion, which gives as if these total tracks were deposited in the voxel. And under that condition, dose equals kerma. If there's equilibrium, you can look at the photon interactions only. If there's no equilibrium, you must look at the electron tracks. And you've all seen this kind of curve before, uh, but I'd like to just point out that you can think of this as well Jerry, I think you got muted. Uh, Dr. Jerry, can you unmute yourself? Unmute, sir. Here we go. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay, yes, thank sir. you. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so as I was saying, you can think of that as energy being projected forward. Uh, and here's a kernel here that we'll talk about in a moment. And these are buckets and they're accumulating the energy that was deposited. And uh, if you have changes in field size, however, strange things begin to happen. The penumbra shape can change. And in addition, the central axis dose can take a nosedive if the field size is very small. And that is very important when it comes to lung because the range of electrons is prolonged. And if you make the field size smaller and smaller, you can see the drop, a very quick drop in the dose within the lung. And this has to be accounted for by algorithms. I like this uh, situation where you have a neighbor who blows or sends the, uh, your, the leaves in the fall, which is the season we have now in Canada, to your neighbor. And uh, of course, you can blow it all back. And that would establish some form of lateral equilibrium. Algorithms at last. This is why you came to this talk, uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Let's talk about that first you will see that these new methods, convolution, Monte Carlo, and Boltzmann, have added the element of non-charged particle equilibrium and can potentially account for both electron density and atomic number changes in the body. So I'm going to focus on the, these three algorithms uh, today. The Monte Carlo methods really go back to Berger and Seltzer. Uh, this is Martin Berger, and this is Steve Seltzer, and eventually got implemented by Ralph Nelson um, at Stanford. This is the first EGS Monte Carlo course. You can recognize important people here. Nelson, David Rogers, Alex Bialayev, 
and myself, although I'm not as important as these two when it comes to Monte Carlo. And basically the Monte Carlo method is, is a series of biased random walks. The particles, a photon can come in and create a shower of other particles. That's the S in EGS, electron gamma shower. To run a simulation, you need to have the geometry of the radiation source, the patient, atomic number of the materials, interaction probabilities, a good set of random numbers. You can tag particles as if they're uh, first particle scattering, second scattering, etc., and it provides a good intuitive inter inter understanding. You have to average, however, millions, if not billions of these histories to get an average dose, and it will have a statistical variance. And the, so the solution doesn't appear instantly, it appears gradually as the number of history grows. I like to use the analogy of a pinball machine. Some of you uh, don't know what that is because they're kind of history now, but you launch a particle, you let the particle scatter, and then you score something. In our case, we score the dose. Why use Monte Carlo? It's intuitive. It's an experiment in slow motion. It can be used to correct any artifacts of an experimental measurement, and it can handle complex boundary conditions. The, but the downside is there is the Poisson noise in the result, and rare bugs are hard to isolate because of the random numbers. Uh, an event can happen rarely, and it's hard to find exactly when it happens. And some critics, the mathematicians especially, will say, oh, this is a brute force method. It's not an elegant solution. Frankly, I don't care if it gives the right answer. I will take an inelegant solution. Monte Carlo applications have been uh, focused on linear accelerator heads, energy deposition kernels, and can be used also as a main engine for treatment planning or as an offline tool for commissioning an algorithm. And you've seen these kinds of diagrams before with individual tracks of the particles, and you can uh, determine a phase space. In other words, at any location along this path, you can bin the information according to the position of the particles, their trajectory, and their current energy level. And that is used both in Monte Carlo methods and in the Boltzmann method that I will describe. A typical photon history flow chart is shown here. A particle starts, and then um, if, if, it, uh, if it is not lost enough energy, the, this will continue into a selection of how far the particle will go, and then what type of interaction, and so on. And then the phase space I talked about will be updated. And these particles are put on a stack, and then that stack is emptied gradually until all the particles are exiting the patient or have come to a, a, a cutoff energy. So this is the, basically what I just described. And I'd like to do uh, the selection of, of an interaction because it's kind of interesting. I've used these plots again. So this is photon energy against atomic number. So if you know what material are in, for example, if I'm in bone, I might be up here with an atomic number roughly 13. And my energy might be 10 MeV, so I'm here. So I take that value and I place it here on this um, line. I call a random number and more random numbers will land because they're uniformly distributed in the red zone here. So more Compton scattering events will occur and fewer pair triplet production events will occur. There'll be fewer hits here than here. And that's how a decision is made between what type of interaction occurs. Electrons are much more complicated. I will not have time to discuss them in detail. Suffice it to say that the electrons are not modeled one event at a time. It would just be horrendous in terms of calculation resources. They are condensed into hard and soft collisions. So if the particle travels along the way, uh, there are a lot of interactions, multiple scattering, and that is a sign of continuous slowing down loss of energy. But once in a while, there's a catastrophic large delta ray it's set in motion, an electron, or a large Bremsstrahl uh, loss of energy. These are called catastrophic events. So this kind of splitting of the tracks into soft and hard collisions 
is very important to speed up the Monte Carlo calculation. Now these calculations, they're known notoriously for being slow. They take a long time. And so um, the accuracy is important, so it needs longer calculation times. And that depends on the field size, the, the size of the patient, the type of resolution, millimeter versus centimeter resolution, and the hardware. The acceleration tricks, they use uh, lookup tables, they force interactions at a point, they split particles, they play Russian roulette with particles that are of no interest, they reject uh, particles that are not reaching points of interest, and they exploit symmetry of the ge geometry. Here are some typical Monte Carlo results. These are play, uh, obtained um, at, at the uh, Royal Marsden Hospital, and it's an unbelievable achievement with CPUs that are fast, uh, and a lot of them in parallel, they achieve uh, this result in about 10 seconds on a Monte Carlo uh, model. This is work from our labs uh, uh, by Brandon Disher, and it, it's a neat trick that we decided to explore. This equilibrium reduces the dose in lung, even if the fluence is higher. So why not use that this equilibrium to spare the lung tissue? So we have done this experiment with small fields um, and, and we can induce lower dose in the lung by uh, causing disequilibrium, which lowers the dose to lung, and you still get a sufficient dose at the tumor. And the beauty of it is if the tumor moves, the dose will chase the tumor. That's an interesting uh, yet unexplored use of uh, disequilibrium. Let's move on to convolution superposition as time is running on. And the big movers were Rock Mackey, Roddy Mohan, and Anders Anishou. So this is an elocution on the evolution of the convolution revolution. Uh, these uh, point kernels were done this way. Photons were, uh, were shot in through Monte Carlo technique and forced to interact at a voxel. And then all the secondary particles were tracked, much like this perfume bottle looking for all the perfume particles. We ran a program with a user code in eggs called SCASP, Scatter Spherical, and we tracked all the scattered radiation. This was done with three or four computers across Canada. Each energy from 0.1 to 50 MeV was analyzed with a million photons minimum. And this took a half CPU year of computation. The good news is this is needed only once for the convolution method. It is recycled data and is a real time saver and is the reason that convolution methods really became quite practical. Here are some kernels. This is the primary kernel, electrons basically. This is first scatter. So these are particles that have scattered once and deposited those downstream and so on with Bremstolo. Anders Anershu uh, uh, did a curve fit so these uh, can also be calculated analytically with curve fit, which accelerates the use of them in convolution methods. So those of you not familiar with convolution processes, it is basically a blurring process. This is the terma, or you can think of it as the photon fluence intensity. This is the kernel. If you convolve these two, you basically add a little fingerprint at each location and you blur the dose in tissue. So that is the process of convolution. But there are some spoilers of convolution. The beam rays are tilted because of beam divergence. The beams are polyenergetic, so you can't really use a monoenergetic photon kernel. You have to average them in some way. And tissue and homogeneities can really mess up the kernels that were done for in water only. So let's look at that. If you have in homogeneities, there's a monkey wrench. Uh, you will change the terma, the primary fluence reaching all points. And in addition, each kernel at a location has to be distorted to account for the local inhomogeneities. So this then is a convolution that is becoming a superposition as opposed to a convolution because the kernel changes at every location. And so this is the complicated math that goes with this. This is a convolution integral. It is not applicable in real life. You must actually look at every location one at a time. S is the sender 
of radiation, r is the receiver. And you cannot just assume the relative distance or the relative vector between them. You must look at their absolute locations, correct the terma, and modify the kernel. Here's an example of a convolution in water for a beam of small uh, size, high energy beam. Here's a superposition where we took into account the lung and homogeneity. And this is a 3D graphic produced by Michael Sharp that shows the disequilibrium in the middle, loss of dose, and the penumbral widening. Acceleration tricks, Art Boyer uh, from Texas. Uh, he uh, tried to use the fast Fourier transform method, but it works mainly in homogeneous tissue, not very well in heterogeneous tissue. You can reduce the dimensions of integration as shown here, but I would say with the current technology, you should really be living here in uh, a 3D space. And the collapse cone convolu convolution is used extensively. It was a trick proposed by Anders Anishu, shown here. And the energy sent out by a kernel is divided into cardinal directions. And then the energy of those cones is collapsed onto a single line. This allows for recursive relationships that are much more efficient. And you can think of this as an umbrella being closed here. There's a bit of cheating because the energy is not placed exactly in the right spot, but overall it's an excellent uh, approximation. Let's go on to the latest star of the show, Boltzmann Transport. This is Boltzmann in 1887 with some of his colleagues. And this is more modern times. This is uh, James Duderstadt, who developed transport theory at the University of Michigan uh, in the United States. And he was joined later by Alex Bialayev, who is an expert on the eggs Monte Carlo system. So it would have been really nice for these two to interact and they still interact, I think, to a certain extent um, and, uh, and see the competition between these two techniques. Let's do an overview of these transport methods. Todd Waring is, is the person responsible for the implementation of this method on varying uh, systems. And he gave a presentation. Uh, he felt like he was a fish out of water because all the other physicists were not familiar with Boltzmann methods. At most, they were familiar with Monte Carlo methods or equivalent to share ratio or convolution or collapse cone, but not with this. Um, and here's the, the little cartoon here showing one penguin that decided uh, to look a little bit different from the, from the neighbors. I won't go into the mathematics in great detail, but I wanna say that if you want to understand this method, you have to get away from a simple understanding of, of dose and scalar quantities. You have to begin to think about vector quantities. So on the left here, all of these are vector quantities. For example, the number density distribution is the number of particles at a certain location, at a voxel, you may think of it that way, going in a certain direction with a certain energy at a moment in time t. And this is sort of a phase space because there's so many parameters for them. And these uh, derive other quantities, including currents. Here, current doesn't mean at this moment in time, it means flow as in an electrical current. So this is sort of a, a current, um, a rate of particles in motion. And that's a very important quantity. These can be integrated into quantities that are scalars and that we are much more familiar with. For example, Fluence, the scalar fluence is here and comes from a couple of integrations of this flux density. So I won't go into this mathematically, just to let you know, you have to change your mentality and you have to think vector. And thinking of vectors, here's the phase space coordinates in more detail. At any moment in time, the particle has a location. It is traveling along a certain direction and it is leaving a voxel or a surface. And we place this vector at a perpendicular position relative to this surface. And the angle between these two is very useful because it allows us to determine whether the direction of the particle is going out this way or coming into a region this way. 
This is just the solid angle, the omega, similar to the solid angles you think about in the klein nishina cross section for Compton scattering. And uh, in the end, you have a cohort of particles that fit within this cone. They're all heading in more or less this direction. And you have phase space coordinates, x, y, z, theta phi for the direction and energy of the particle. So this is a six dimensional space. That scares a lot of people, but it shouldn't. If you think of phase space as a histogram, and you're familiar with histograms in two tags or 2D, think of the phase space in six dimensions as some kind of histogram where you have six coordinates that tell you how many particles are in that space. The other important feature is that there are phase space exchanges. Remember, I mentioned that electrons are very important in those deposition. So we must not only track the photons and where they are and where they're going, but also the secondary electrons. And the cross sections, the atomic cross sections, like the klein nishina cross section, is basically the rules that apply when particles of one species uh, create particles of another species. And I like to think of that as playing chess. All the particles have rules on what they can do and where they can go. And that governs what particles from here get transported in a sense, their energy gets transported to this region. So two phase spaces have to be tracked during a Boltzmann calculation. Think of flows as well. These are familiar flows. I'm not sure if you can see this graphic, but that's how I visualize this flow of particles in, in a phase space. And this of course is uh, at your sink and this is somewhere else. So net flow across a volume. Imagine the soccer ball is your voxel. Then uh, for each place on the surface, we place this normal vector coming out. We have particles going along this direction and that, currents, that creates a current called J, the current density distribution. Um, and we also know the energy of the particle. So J is actually a multiplication of the velocity of the particles against the number of particles that you have. If you take the dot product, this is a crucial um, operation within the vector space of the current with this vector that represents the area and, and the normal to the area, you end up distinguishing what particles are flowing, let's say north, as opposed to which ones are flying south because the dot product will change sign. If furthermore, you integrate over the entire soccer ball, all these patches, this way, you can take advantage of a theorem, Gauss's theorem, a divergence theorem, and you can do a volume integration of the divergence of this current. That will give you the net outflow rate of energy from this ball. And the net outflow means some energy got left behind and you can determine the dose. I have a little Mickey Mouse uh, explanation here, but I may have to skip it. But I just wanted to point out that uh, the Boltzmann method is really a bookkeeping exercise. If you're interested in the green photons coming into a voxel, you can track how many green photons have been stopped in the volume, for example, by a photoelectric death, or got through the volume and come out the other side. And you can also track particles that had a higher energy and got, caused the birth of the green photons. And if you do all that bookkeeping, you do end up with the divergence um, equation I showed before. And you can also calculate the dose like a customs officer, looking at how many particles came in, how much energy or money got deposited within the voxel, and it all works out. It's a Mickey Mouse example, and I encourage all of you during the replay to go through this calculation because that is what the Boltzmann method is doing. It is tracking the net number of particles that come from volume. It looks at the number of particles that were produced in the volume. It takes away the number of particles that were removed from the volume. It looks at mathematically this divergence 
um, giving the net gain must be equal to the gains that occurred from, for example, high energy particles coming into a, a histogram bin of the desired energy or the losses due to absorption. And the goal of a Boltzmann calculation is to predict actually the electron and positron, mainly electron fluence. Uh, and from that, if you know the electron fluence and you remember what I've been harping on, all X-ray energy is deposited by charged particles, you can calculate the dose. So if you do all these steps correctly, you will have produced the fluence of electrons everywhere in the patient and you can calculate the dose very simply. So approximations are done in the Acuros technique. Series expansions are used. There are some phase space quantizations. They don't determine the phase space at every micro loss of energy. There's some binning going on and the physics simplifications are taken. Positrons are treated like positive electrons. That's a minor sin and there's no Bremsstrahlung. And it's an iterative solution of a system of equations. It's not one equation, it's an entire system of many equations. Typical results, here's a 6MV rapid arc uh, done with the Acuros algorithm completed in 86 seconds. Here's another one, uh, head and neck, 163 seconds. These are incredible results. State of the art, where are we? If you're not confused at this stage, you probably didn't understand what I said. You will have to run the replay. Here are the speeds in teraflops of different computer technologies. This was in 2016. It surpassed the 10 megaflop uh, per second speed. And that is roughly where you have to be for a fast Monte Carlo or Boltzmann calculation. Here are the algorithms of the day. Phillips uh, very much collapsed cone convolution. Varian offers uh, an AAA algorithm, but also a Monte Carlo simulation of the head, phase spaces, and has an electron beam uh, patient space algorithm. And, and of course has got the, uh, the Boltzmann method, the Acuros. Ray search, collapsed cone, and Monte Carlo, but it's an expensive option. And Electa Monaco has a photon beam Monte Carlo system. These methods are all interconnected. The linear Boltzmann is the grandfather equation, and it can be seen as a, a, a superset of the Monte Carlo calculation that uses a random sampling to get the, the uh, result. Scatter kernels came for the convolution method from Monte Carlo, and it would be technically possible to get Green's function solutions uh, of the Boltzmann equation, and that would give also the kernels that you need for convolution, but that has not been done. That is not a path that has been traveled. How did the Monte Carlo method evaluate the Boltzmann integral? It's quite simple. Imagine uh, a rectified sinusoidal curve, and you're trying to determine the area or the integral. You can randomly send points in this space, and the fraction of the points that are in the hit space compared to the box will give you an evaluation of the area under the curve. That's basically what the Monte Carlo method is doing. Uh, if you want to use superposition, you use this Green's function. That's like a kernel in the uh, Boltzmann method. And if you want to do a convolution, you just replace these individual coordinates by the, the, uh, the difference uh, vector, and you now have the convolution. So that can be derived from the Boltzmann equation. This is a, a grander summary, but I'm a bit over time. I won't go through it in detail. That compares the Monte Carlo method to the uh, Boltzmann method. Big difference is that uh, Monte Carlo method runs one particle at a time, and the Boltzmann method solves for cohorts of particles. The result is definitive. It's an expectation value by Boltzmann method, and it converges to the right average uh, in Monte Carlo method, but has noise on it. This is a plot of how uh, computation times have allowed us to go from scatter error ratio methods, the convolution method, to the methods of today. And this time scale will shrink as computers continue to go faster and faster. This is a grand summary. I don't expect you to read it. I just want you to, sh to show you that Acuros is used clinically. 
uh, operates in minutes, as I showed before, even uh, seconds. The Monte Carlo methods, if you use a full-blown eggs model, they're quite slow, uh, tens of minutes. But if you look at this phi code, the DPM code at the Royal Marsden, I'm sorry, I may have said the wrong uh, institute here before, the Royal Marsden Hotel, <laughs> Royal Marsden Institute, you will find about 30 seconds of calculation time, which is remarkable. So the Monte Carlo and Boltzmann methods are complementary. Uh, and they, depending on the complexity of the problem, one might be faster than the other. I think we're at the pivot point right now, and it will be a photo finish as to which method will in the long term win the race. Closing words of wisdom, never fool the physics. All algorithms have hidden assumptions. Be aware of that. Develop trust. Do some spot checking. Look for black swan conditions that are rare, like disequilibrium. And these two methods can yield gold standard results. And then the big question becomes, do you trust your dosimeter? Which do you believe more, the Monte Carlo and Boltzmann result or your dosimeter, which has readings that may be subject to artifacts? So try, try, trust takes years to develop and it takes seconds to destroy. Thank you for listening to me. If you uh, are interested, these are the main reference points. And, and this book, uh, I'll do a little bit of an ad, is now uh, in a paperback format and sells for about $50 uh, US. But if you use this discount code at the publisher site, you get another 30% off. So it's, it's a pretty economical book for graduate students and residents and for faculty as well. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, I will uh, take them by email or in the chat line now. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for an excellent talk. Uh, I think you have condensed uh, all the algorithms to <laughs> just uh, a 15 minutes talk. Um, I have it one question not easy. from. <laughs> yeah, I do understand. I have one question from one of the participants, uh, uh, Dr. Venugopal, uh, who says in accuracy XB calculation, dose to water or dose to medium, which should be used for patient calculation? <laughs> That's uh, really still under debate. And uh, look up the, the, uh, the articles by Pedro and Andreo. Um, some argue it should be water because you've calibrated your beams in water. Others argue, well, that's fine. But in tissue is more realistically representative of what happens locally. For example, if you were looking at the dose in bone and you thought that was important, and there's significant pair production, then you're better to look at that to make sure that there isn't an accented um, a dose problem in bone. So I think it depends on the application. If both are options, you might want to look at the two and, and compare and do a difference map or something like that. But it's, it's not a clear answer. And uh, the personal preference is to do the dose in the tissues of interest. Um, rather than in the calibration state, but there, then there could be a disconnection with the absolute calibration. We can continue the discussion by email if you wish, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Gary. I, I have one doubt, which probably uh, consider me as a resident now for a moment, because <laughs> I don't know much about algorithms. Uh, when I uh, start working with the Eclipse planning system, I had in my clinic both AAA which is convolution superposition, if I understand correctly, and uh, across. But when we commission across, we have to feed CT calibration as mass density uh, versus CT number. When we commission across, we put electron, relative, relative electron density and the CT number calibration. May I know why this mass density versus CT number in the case of Accruals. Is there any specific? Thing are you able to see? Are you still able to see uh, the screen, Paul? Yeah, you had a hockey stick. Is there? Yeah. Okay, I'll take that out. <laughs> so, um, if you look here at the equation uh, on the on the left, this is the relative electron density. So that's the electron density in electrons per centimeter cube of of the tissue divided by the electron density of water, which is 3.34 by 10 to the 23rd electrons per centimeter cube. I thought I would impress you with that. And, uh, and it's calculated this way. 
if you see here, the, the mass densities are on the, the far right. So the two are quite connected. Um, so it's not a big difference unless the atomic number is, is different. And that's why we see this, this slope here. So the answer to the question is that in the actual calculation, the electron density in the actual algorithm is more important than the mass density. And there should be some kind of conversion that takes that into account just in case you're in atomic number of materials that are different. If it's all uh, tissue, soft tissue, it doesn't really make much difference. But you know, in the skull, it might make a difference. Uh, in in the spinal cord neighborhood, it might make a difference. So um, it is a disconnect, and it it's preferred in the in the algorithm to use the electron density, not the mass density. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question, a uh, futuristic question. Uh, with what is the future of those calculation algorithms? Will it be replaced by AI-driven algorithms uh, with the availability of plenty of planning data replace the conventional algorithms? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I, you know, I'll go back to my first statement. You cannot fool the physics. Um, and the AI has taken off and deep learning has taken off where you can produce uh, distributions that that and con contours, for example, that come from experience and and essentially a massive curve fit. But if you don't trust the curve fit, you won't trust the result. So I think we're in a transition zone. And looking at this this graph, perhaps the next blip up will be AI assisted treatment planning, no doubt. But whether you would trust the algorithm, the the, the detailed physics to a pattern recognition program, personally, I would not uh, trust that. But I'm also of a different generation and, and perhaps there's some deep learning in there that, uh, that might change my mind. But at this moment in time, I would, I would stick to Monte Carlo and Boltzmann as being closer to gold truth. Uh, there is a question on uh, your comments on commercial photon brachytherapy algorithms. So uh, if you look, it's very interesting because if you look at a brachytherapy dose computation, it is basically a convolution. <laughs> if you think of the source as being a kernel, and then you put the sources of different intensity in different locations in the patient, then that summation is a convolution. And the kernels are normally kept um, constant as being spatially invariant. So it is a convolution. There are more modern methods uh, that are possible. I don't know the latest in terms of commercial packages, but there are uh, publications on doing in homogeneity corrections, uh, even for brachytherapy. So th that would be a good, a good step if it's available. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, but um, they, basically the traditional way of doing brachytherapy is not that far away from it's not obsolete um, because it is, in fact, one of the earliest forms of convolution, although people did not recognize that it was a convolution. By the way, convolution is used enormously in image processing. And for example, the modulation transfer function is, is related to uh, convolutions and um, it's used extensively there, but it took almost five years for the radiotherapy physicists to realize they were doing a convolution. And that uh, goes back to the Rock Mackey days. I, I think I pointed that out to him and uh, he took off with the idea after we realized that this is used often in, in brachytherapy and also in imaging. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. It has been a wonderful talk. I uh, see a lot of compliments complaining coming on the uh, <laughs> screen. Uh, uh, <laughs> A lot of compliments, not complaints, sorry, for the sake <laughs> of the time. <laughs> a lot of compliments coming on. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, great talk. And I would like to tell all the participants that Dr. Jerry has written a book on those calculation algorithm, which he showed a few minutes ago. Uh, it is, will be a useful book for uh, particularly for students and the teachers who teach with medical physics and particularly about algorithms. Uh, I see John Schreiner there on the screen. Uh, 
I think next time I will contact you for a talk, John, if you're free. Okay, good. Thank you, John. Um, is there any other question from members? Uh, uh, we would like to, before uh, we close so this session. Question. Pardon? There is one question. There is one question. Uh, what is your opinion about the gold standard calculation algorithms for the heavy ions? Jerry? Oh, ah, I, I, uh, I had some experience with heavy ions many, many years ago with a project that unfortunately did not get funded. It was called MARIA, Medical Accelerator Research Institute in Alberta. And we were proposing a synchrocyclotron to produce carbon ions way back in the 1980s, which eventually I think it materialized into the Shiba accelerator in Japan. Um, I have not followed the algorithms uh, that are used for heavy ions, so I really cannot comment, uh, but it's, it's clear that they would resemble more the, um, the methods that were used for electron beams, the fermi eggs kind of calculations, and they are, in fact, uh, quite similar to convolution and also a sort of a hybrid with, um, with um, the Boltzmann method. I'll also point out something interesting, especially in a, a country like India. Many, many years ago, this book was published by uh, some uh, famous professor in India, and it is being used and has been used for decades for space radiation dosimetry. And uh, it's, it's heavy going. Uh, this is not for the faint of heart, um, but these types of methods have been used for heavy ions and heavy high energy uh, ions in space dosimetry. And there's no reason that they could not be used in medical physics. So I would think that uh, Boltzmann style methods uh, will work their way into uh, heavy ion uh, dose calculations. And Monte Carlo, of course, was also used. So it, again, will be a, a discussion between those two. Uh, thanks a lot, Jerry. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I think we can close this session saying a great thank you to Jerry for this wonderful talk. And, uh, it was my like pleasure. The... It was my pleasure to seeing all of you uh, virtually. And I hope you will enjoy the replays and uh, slow it down a bit because there's okay. some areas that I rushed. So use the pause button. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for that. And uh, we will be uh, uploading it, uh, the talk into our e-learning website shortly. So members will have access to this talk uh, to go through. Uh, I hope, uh, Jerry, I think I mentioned to you about our e-learning website that we college pass. So we will have that. Uh, uh, certainly we will upload it within a week's time and members, who are all watching, you will have access, uh, or you create your access to go and listen to these talks. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, uh, email me. Is... Email you can email me questions directly if you were too shy to ask a question here. I'd be uh, happy would you to mind try to... typing. Uh, Jerry, would you mind typing your email onto the screen so that people can note it? Can you just uh, okay? Just hold on for a minute. Um, do you see it there? Ah, yes, J2B. Oh, okay, good. Uh, at uwo.ca. Okay, so members, please note that. If you have any questions, please do get in touch with Dr. Jerry Batista. Bye to all. Bye. Thank you very much. See you all next time. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Uh, See you half, an hour, half an hour back, we are meeting again. Dr. Pauls, I thank you for uh, allowing me to attend. That was very nice. Oh, Thanks for sending uh, me the, the link. Uh, thank you, John. It is great to see you after yep. a long, long time. And uh, hope to have you also on board with our CMPI lectures. Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, entertain you a little bit. Not as well as Jerry can, but uh, <laughs> I, I'd be happy to entertain. I doubt, I doubt that. We've been on the stage before together, and uh, he's a fine speaker. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Bye now. Thank you.